Then they ramped things up. The next year, they sold $2 billion worth. Oh, my gosh. And then the year after that, they sold almost $6 billion worth. Of that one thing? That one toy. Wow. A, you know, a $15 toy. So I looked at it and I said, well, this thing's selling really well. I'm going to create some ways to make it even more fun for kids. Mm -hmm. So I came up with two or three ideas. You're listening to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. This is your seat at the table. Thanks for tuning in to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. Today, Roland sits down with Bob Serling of Licensing Lab, who helps companies turn their assets into six- and seven-figure profit centers. This is a fascinating and super helpful episode. And if you enjoy the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts and visit businesslunchpodcast.com for show notes and more. Okay, let's get started. Hey, Roland Frazier here, and I am here in beautiful San Diego today with, which is kind of cold, with Bob Serling from Licensing Lab. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roland. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming in today. So just to kind of get started, will you give a little background on what Licensing Lab is and what you do now? So almost anything that a business owns is an asset that can be licensed, whether that's a physical product, a training program, a service intellectual property, such as, you know, say their business systems they've developed, marketing systems, all of those things are licensable assets. And most companies don't realize that. So I help companies take the assets that they already have and turn them into new six and seven figure profit centers. And then I also uh, do more traditional type of licensing, like developing products for large corporations and then licensing them out to those corporations, things like toys, software. I uh, even did an insurance product, nice. even though I know nothing about the insurance industry. And it all comes down to that common denominator that any asset can be licensed. So just for everybody that's listening so they're clear, what is licensing exactly? Licensing is really pretty simple. It's paying for the use of something. You don't own it, you use it. And a good example is, say, the mailing list software. doesn't matter if you're on Infusionsoft or Aweber, Constant Contact, whatever it is, you don't own that software. You pay a fee monthly mm -hmm. to use it, and that's a license. So Microsoft, so anybody that's using right, that or... Right. So if you stop paying that fee, you no longer have use of it. Now mm -hmm. you have your list. They don't own your list. Right. So, But you're paying for the ability to communicate with the list. And do you have uh, any like kind of famous examples of licensing that maybe you've seen out in the market that people would be able to kind of relate to before we dive into the details of it? Okay, so you take the George Foreman grill. Mm -hmm. George Foreman did not invent that grill. He didn't make it. He's probably never been to the factory that does make it, that's in China. Mm -hmm. What George did was he licensed his name and his image to that company. They pay him a fee. Now, I don't know, that, that fee can be structured differently. It can be an annual fee, or it can be based on how many units are sold, which would be a royalty. Mm -hmm. And it may be a combination of those, mm -hmm. a fee plus a royalty. So he licensed his name. Right. He licensed, and eventually got paid a couple hundred million bucks, right? Yeah. So what they did at the end of that, for anybody that, is listing. So there was this little cookie grill thing that was a, a gadget that you basically is like a waffle iron yeah. that you put hamburgers and meat and stuff in. You close it, it sizzles them, cooks them, and then drains the fat out. And George Foreman, former boxer guy, uh, world champion, endorsed it. And for some reason, it just took off like crazy. Right? Exactly. It sold hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff. And then ultimately, it started as a license where he licensed his name. He acted as, as a spokesperson right. for the grill. And then ultimately, it was so profitable that the people who had entered into the license with Foreman said, we'd like to just buy the right to be able to use in perpetuity right. this. And so that's another form of license. It's just a 
license in perpetuity for, exactly. for a flat fee. Exactly. And that was it was a couple hundred million bucks, right? They paid. You know, I wasn't aware of that aspect yeah. of it. So it was yeah, a that's ton. cool. Yeah. Okay. You know, same thing happened with Tony Hawk. He licensed his name and image to EA Sports, and, and it was actually Sony before then for their game Tony Hawk Underground. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, he was making so much money in royalties that they said, we'd like to buy you out. And the figure I heard, and this goes back 15 years ago, was a $25 million buyout. It was initially 500000 Yeah. And he, he went to his advisors and said, you know, is this a good deal? And they were like, no, I don't no. think I did. And he said he was very happy that he got that advice and that he, he, like, he needed the money, really. Do you remember that? He really needed the money because we had him, we, we talked to him about it and he told that story. Yeah. And he's like, man, if I had done that, it would have just been well, I wasn't aware so of that. bad. And he's like, I really needed the money at the time, but it was, was kind of cool. That's a, that's a great example. Yeah. And I want to hear, because you, you did a, a deal with him on a product, I think, right? Actually, I did a deal with a toy company that had a deal with him for okay. his image. It, and that's another advantage to licensing. So this is kind of a cool tangent. Okay. When you license something to a company, you, other than maybe developing a cheap, crude prototype like I did for $31, mm-hmm. you don't have any cost. So I, I took a toy skateboard that already existed, and this company that made them, they had licenses with Tony, and six other big skateboarding brands to put their images on the toy skateboards. So I developed a little add-on that went on to the board that made it more fun for the kids. Basically, it was a little piece that had a, a piece of flint in it, and when they dragged the tail, it would shoot off a big ball of sparks. Right. And it was called Firefoot. Yeah. But the cool thing is... That was is, super popular for a while. I yeah, remember seeing a lot of was. videos. It was, it was those, real and, popular, yeah. it was, and it was fun, and it was... Very cool. You know, you walk in at that time, Toys R Us was the big toy store, or you go in there or Walmart or Target, and there's a wall full of your toy there. It's, it's cool. fun to see. Yeah. So, but the interesting thing is when I licensed that, I got a fairly small fee and a royalty, but I had no cost. So they spent, I think it was about a million and a quarter in manufacturing and another million and a half to two million in advertising. Right. I had none of that expense. Right. I also didn't have any of the expense of them sending their engineers to China to build the molds and everything else and the production. I had none of the costs of shipping. I didn't have to get distribution all over the world like they had. So you essentially have, I mean, this company at the time, they were a fairly small toy company. They were doing maybe 150 million a year in sales, which mm-hmm. is small for a company that size. But really, I had the use of, what, maybe $20 million in assets mm-hmm. that I didn't pay a penny for. And I didn't have any of the risk. Yeah. If and the it, toy flopped, that $2.5 million they had invested was out of their pocket, not mine. So that's one of the real benefits to licensing. Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute. So, because a lot of people invent things, I bet a lot of people that are listening have invented things or thought about or said, I could, or I thought of that a long time ago, yeah. now that's out there making millions of dollars. But a lot of people don't know how to get things to market and don't really appreciate or understand until they get into it how expensive it is. Yeah. Which is why on Shark Tank and things like that, you have people saying, no, let's find somebody that already has that and we'll license it to them. Exactly. Will you explain? A little bit about that, like let's walk through your example. So you saw people skateboarding, you're like, hey, what if we put you know this on the bottom and it, it's like, oh, that's really cool, and everybody likes it. And now you say, I could turn this into a business. What would you have to go through to do that versus the license deal? <laughs> well, it, first of all, you'd have to learn how to manufacture things. Mm-hmm. You go to China, you figure it out. You have to go to China. Probably get screwed a couple times. You'd get screwed. You'd you'd eventually end up with a broker who did all that for you, right. who knew the ins and outs and who to bribe, who not to bribe. Right. Then you have to buy a bunch of inventory. Yeah, then you have to buy inventory. Yeah. The, then you've got to get a distributor to pick it up. That is the biggest yeah. part, and that is extremely difficult. With no track record, very few distributors want to talk to you. Now, if I could have brokered a license with Tony Hawk on my own, 
Now, I understand at the time his minimum fee to even start was between two and four million. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to pull that out of pocket too. Mm -hmm. Then maybe a distributor would be interested because it would be associated with his name. Right. If it was a toy, just the generic toy without his name, the distributor probably wouldn't even talk to you. So after all the expense of creating that, manufacturing, building inventory, renting a warehouse to put the inventory in, all of a sudden I discover nobody wants it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is small toy companies, there are people who go that route. So we're in San Diego, there's a toy company up in Carlsbad called, I believe it's called Marky Mark. Mm -hmm. And they sell, they manufacture and sell all their own toys. But it's an absolute nightmare because they can really only get into very small independent stores and maybe small drugstore chains. You right. won't find their toys. In, so the number one toy seller in the U.S. right now is Walmart. Number two is Target. There's some hints that Toys R Us may make a comeback, mm-hmm. but that's... Such a good brand. I yeah. can't imagine somebody doesn't buy that and try to well, revitalize it. A number of toy company executives want to go in jointly and buy it, but whether that happens or not. But the point is, those big stores, no chance you're going to see that brand in those stores. Right. So he's, unless he has a breakout hit, which you can never predict. Right. And a breakout hit only occurs at Christmas. If he was somehow able to create a viral breakout hit, then he could get a major distributor. Right. So we're talking about toys now, but it's going to be the same in industry, any industry. You invent a new... It's time, it's money, it's uh, the expense for inventory, for travel, for manufacturing, for molds and all that. And then at the end of the day, I think the average one of those companies is maybe operating between an 8 and 15% margin, right? Meaning for every million they make, they're only taking 80,000-ish you know, down to the bottom line to maybe 150. And the sticking point is always distribution because there's only so much shelf space yeah. for something that's going to be in physical stores. And even Amazon doesn't take just everything. They'll right. take almost everything. Right. But and it's up to you on, yeah, the, but on say, there to say, say you develop a new tool. Mm-hmm. Well, the name of the game is going to be Home Depot, Lowe's, and a couple of the other chains that compete with them. But there's such limited shelf space yeah. in stores that, again... Which they rent to you now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, again, the distributor is not going to talk to you if you don't have a track record, if you're not a name brand. So what would one expect? Let's say that we started that business, so we need to raise 3 or $4 million to get into it. And then at the end of the day, we're going to be in, you know, let's say we're going to do really well and we're going to be at a 15% margin. If instead we were to take the great idea we had to, and I'm sure that the rates go all over the board, but let's say, let's just use the toy industry since, since you do a whole lot of work there. You invent the super cool toy thing. What would you expect to receive on sales? Okay, so first of all, you're going to get some fee up front, mm-hmm. and that's always negotiable. Or you may not. It can be anywhere from zero to maybe, generally what you do is they'll calculate sales at a, they'll project their own sales. They know right. how to do that very well. Right. And they may come in and give you anywhere between 2 and 5% of that as your upfront fee. Okay. So assuming they thought it was going to sell, let's say, a million, then you would expect twenty to 50000 Yeah. And would that be a fee or an advance against sales? It's an advance against sales. Okay. Yeah. So if then sales were 5%, you would not get any more money because you had gotten Exactly. Okay. So then you negotiate your royalty rate. And royalty rates, so for the toy industry, they're usually between 3 and 7%. Mm-hmm. And 3 and 7% of wholesale price or retail? Of wholesale price. Yeah. In the book industry, it's typically uh, 7 to 9% mm-hmm. for an author. And then each industry has its own standard percentages. But the difference is, The other way you were getting, if you're at a 15% margin, like you said, yeah, you're getting 15%, but you have all those other costs, all the other time, all the, uh, all the risk here, you're getting say five, 6% with no risk. Right. And it's 
practically guaranteed. The big companies are smart. There aren't many products they put out that bomb. So if you get them to take your idea, there's a good chance it's going to sell. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things, a little sidetrack, one of the things I do to make sure that more of my products get placed is I almost never invent an original product. Mm. What I do instead is invent an improvement to something that's selling really well. And you were talking about that, our little mastermind group that you run. Yeah. The, with the egg thing, right? Right. What, will you share with people just kind of your process? Because I thought that was really cool. So sure. you, you decided you wanted to get back into that toy market. Right. And so you did some research and tell, tell that story because I think yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah, so there's this, this little toy and it's an entire industry now. There's 20 knockoffs. Every big company does it. But a company called MGA Entertainment, who was a kind of a mid-level toy company, the owner, I can't remember his name, but he's, he's in his late 60s, early 70s, but he's very astute and he tracks trends and he was following YouTube and he noticed how big the trend was for kids to watch box opening videos of toys. And it was huge. I mean, uh, there was a, there was a young kid who was seven or eight years old doing box openings, mm -hmm. and he was making something like eleven million dollars in fees from his that he was getting from YouTube on his openings. So the CEO of MGA looked at this and says, "I'm going to create a toy that is a box opening." Mm -hmm. So in other words, it was a surprise. So it was an egg, and it had six or seven little pieces in it and two or three or, or maybe five of them were listed on the front of the box and the other two were surprises and it was called LOL Surprise. Okay. And he liked that name because it also tied in to the whole social aspect. Right. Laugh out loud surprise. Right. So he started selling it. This goes back maybe four years ago and it was the number one toy at Christmas just blew everybody away. No one had ever heard of it. And they ran out of inventory because they had no idea how big it was going right, to be. Right. And I forget what it was. They sold, I think maybe they sold $70 million worth at Christmas season, which is the big season for yeah. toys. Then they ramped things up. The next year, they sold $2 billion worth. Oh my gosh. And then the year after that, they sold almost $6 billion worth. Of that one thing? That one toy, wow. a, you know, a $15 toy. And now every company, every big company, Hasbro has their version of it. Mattel has their version. Five or six other toy companies have surprise toys. It's become a surprise toy industry. Right. But so I looked at it and I said, well, this thing's selling really well. I'm going to create some ways to make it even more fun for kids. Mm -hmm. So I came up with two or three ideas. So just so people that are listening could think about doing this themselves. So you decided you want to get back into this. The very first thing you said is what's hot, right? Yes, what's selling? Exactly. What do you do to research to find that out? It, what's great is you can get literally tens of millions of dollars of research for free. Right. You go to the to Amazon and you look at the bestseller categories. Okay. So you go to bestsellers. Right. right. But you also go to the trade journals for whatever industry you're in. So you would Google toys trade right. journal. Right. Okay. And they will always list what the previous year's bestsellers were. Right. And so then you looked at that and yeah. said, this is the thing. Was that the number one and you wanted number one? Or was it that was the one you said, I think I can probably No, that, that was number one. Okay. I, I wanted number I, I didn't necessarily want number one. I just... I was kind of attracted to that. I just go with things that, so if number one is something that's great, but I have no interest in it and no idea how I'd work with it, mm. I put it aside. Okay, great. But in this case, it was number one. Okay, so then the next thing that you do is think about improving it or what? Yeah, okay. exactly. And what, how, what's your process for that? First of all, I go out and I buy three or four different versions of the toy and I take them apart and I play with them. And I look at things and I think either what's missing or if it has everything, if everything here is really cool, what could I add that would make it even better? Okay. 
And I will then start researching a lot of other toys. And I'll research other things that aren't necessarily toys, but that people play with maybe camping stuff or just different things. And, and this is what, what I call profit cloning, mm -hmm. where I look for an aspect of something that's really fun mm -hmm. that I can bolt on to that. Okay. So it's some of it is just, you know, experience and being able to look at something and go, oh, this would be cool. Mm -hmm. Some of it is digging into memory of toys that I've worked with over the years and saying, okay. wow, what if I pulled this forward? So it's really that. looking, you look first within the industry and then you're looking for kind of cross-industry ideas of yeah. things that you might be able to apply based on things that are popular in other exactly. places. Exactly. Did you find any in the egg thing? Yeah, I found two or three. Okay. Can you tell us about them? I really can't because okay. they're still in play. Still doing it? Okay. Yeah. But Can you I tell will, us about one you did? Maybe I will tell past? you what's really interesting that came out of that. Okay. So what happened was one of the things I came up with they liked a lot and they said, we really like it, but we can't work with you on it because we already have it in development. And I'm on Zoom with the head of inventor relations for MGA and he pops up his graphic showing me the, their storyboard for their toy. And it's very close and that's cool. I said, great, so, but we like these other couple ideas, but our pipeline is two years two years out before we start considering newer ideas. Okay. And, so, and that's why these things are still in play. Mm -hmm. But even if they never did anything with those ideas, the fact that my quote-unquote failed idea, because they were already doing something, said, I like the way you think. Would you like to be on our preferred developers list? Nice. So now, twice each year, they send me a wish list of toys and games that's pretty cool, that they'd huh? like to see develop. And yeah. then they just basically let the their preferred developer list yeah. create the that's best right. thing. So they're crowdsourcing yeah. their yeah. newest thing. Now they thing. have an R&D department yeah. too, but... But they're also telling you this is what we want, sure. which is and smart, priceless. And smart companies realize that as good as their R&D department is, they don't have a corner on all ideas. Yeah. Smart. And they'd be happy to pay a 5 6% royalty on a, on a product that's going to sell another $100 million for them. Nice. So, yeah. So, you have taken all of this experience because you've done this across lots of different things. I think you did software, right? Mm -hmm. And then you did toys. Did you do some, some other products well, as well? I did it with, I actually developed an insurance, the insurance product thing, yeah. Yeah, for a company that was selling insurance products. I, I, the funny thing is, I still don't understand much of anything about insurance, but I have another insurance product in That's development. Funny. Nice. So, so you've done this across several industries several times successfully, because I know that you have the joint venture programs that you've talked about, because you put yep. a lot of those together, and it's a course and I went through. It's great. I think it was million dollar that licensing. That was called million dollar licensing at the time. Yeah. And then you also have one on licensing, I think, which I don't think I have been through. Yeah, I, I actually just completed that. And that's kind of, it's kind of the, the latest evolution of the program you went through. So if you were going to give us the, the light version of it, and then we'll tease people to, so if so, and we'll give them a link if they want at the end. And sure. I, this is no affiliates thing, so I don't ever do that. But I believe that you, you produce good products because I've seen it. And you've had success and you, you're one of the rare people that actually does what you're teaching as opposed to, <laughs> you know, researching it and then just selling it. So if you were going to give, say, somebody comes to you and you take them under your wing and you say, here, look, here's the crash course. What, what does that look like? What are the things they should be thinking about? How, how would they approach it? Well, there's a couple different categories. So if you want to license products like toys, tools, household goods, anything like we talked about, that's really what is commonly called inventing. Mm -hmm. So, and the inventing path is a little different okay. than licensing the assets that a company already has. So, if somebody says they want, it, they're interested in getting into licensing, then. right? Okay. okay. So, I teach five different ways of licensing, which a company can use to license the assets they have, okay, or somebody can come along as a consultant 
and broker those types of deals for companies. Okay. The companies that do want to license their assets but say, we don't want to learn it, you do it for us, we'll pay you a fee and a royalty. Okay. And it can be anything from taking your own systems, say, I remember, and this wasn't mine, but this was brilliant. Years ago, there was a, a printer, a commercial printer, and he developed a process for thinning ink out to where he could print a higher quality image with 20% of the ink. Wow. And because of that, he could also go to a thinner stock because you needed a thicker stock with more ink because once it absorbed it, it would right. get too wet and, right. and crinkle. So he then took that process and started licensing it to other commercial printers. And you know, somebody might say, well, that's your competition, mm -hmm. but it isn't really because he probably had what? 1% of the market. Yeah. Yeah. It allows most. you to get way yeah. bigger. And market it allows penetration. you to get such, so, so. And that otherwise they're going to figure out like, like egg thing, they're going to knock it off. Anyway. That's right. So license it. So you don't get out spent by somebody that doesn't even care and will just fight you on the league. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So he started making tons of money from doing that. And then probably more typical is, so another form of licensing is certification, right? So you take a program you have and you certify people in using it. And then they have to pay to be recertified right. on a regular basis because they're only licensing it. The, the, they have the certification, but they license the materials that they're going to use from you. Okay. So, and you can do that with anything, whether it's training people to do Facebook ads, whether it's training people to teach yoga, like te Bikram yeah, has, I was right? going to say, I, I, I was going to say, uh, uh, teach uh, dog behavior, yeah, you know, yeah. or all all of yeah. And Bikram is a great example. Yeah, hot yoga for yeah. those who don't know. Yeah. All the hot yoga studios you see, he's licensed that methodology to them. Yeah. And he gets a piece of all of that, but they control it. So it's not a franchise, it's a license. Yeah. And you can do that with any system you have, any training program you have, any service you offer. You can certify other people to do that. Yeah, I like also, the, they were a client of ours, but, but when I was a kid growing up, I everything was UL listed. Yes. And I was like, UL listed, I don't know what that is. And then it's, it's like underwriters laboratories. Yeah. And then when they became a client of ours, we found out that, because I had, hadn't seen it since, and I was like, oh, I remember these guys. Yeah. And I thought it was like a government agency or something, but it's like that UL listing just is a certification stamp, mm -hmm. and they get paid by the stamp by anybody that wants that on there. And then my partner, one of my business partners, Perry Belcher, told me that there's uh, same thing like for hand dryers. There's a like a health kind of seal yeah. thing that goes on every single one. And it's like big business selling these little, the, the other companies the ability to say that they have met your certification and minimum that, requirements. And that exists in almost every industry, in the auto industry. What's the big one? That does the the user the JD Powers or the JD Powers. Yeah, if you want the J, if you want the JD Power, if you uh, want to display that symbol display on your that, thing. That's yeah. right. You're yeah. certified. It's the yeah. same thing, and they license that out to you. You you pay a fee right. every year for it. So a couple of things. Then the first one was I think process. Right. If if you've got a process, mm -hmm. then that's something you can license out. The second thing you mentioned was certifications, which is everything from training, which we do at Digital Marketer and also mm -hmm. at our real estate worldwide. And and then there's three more that, that kind of so any business system you have, any okay. marketing system. What an example of that. Be? Okay. So years ago I wrote a when I was still doing copywriting I wrote a lead generation letter for a client. They were doing about two to $3 million in business a year. Mm -hmm. And they took it and they sent it to one client, a client they had been trying to get for four or five years, just couldn't get in the door. They called them the next day. The client called the next day and said, we love this. Can you fly out to Washington, D.C. tomorrow? And he said, absolutely. We went to the meeting walked away with a letter of an agreement for a $25 million deal. So 
people started calling that the $25 million letter. Uh And it was a page and a quarter. It was really simple lead gen. And we could go off on a copywriting tangent, but most people make their lead generation too complicated. Right. People don't want to hear all the details. Sure. They want to hear the benefit. And that's all that letter did. Right. Could you mind just so people have context sharing what was the product and what was the benefit? What was kind of the the um, crux of the thing that you think made you know, the difference? I, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> for his, well, I know what his product was. Yeah. He he did emergency website development for highly secured government installations. Okay. And and so you wrote a cop. You wrote copy right. for him to sell that to other right. people. Right. And but, the the main thing is that you had to have a very high level security clearance right. to do it and which he had but trying to get through to people at either the defense department itself mm-hmm. or in the defense industry was really difficult so we were able to get through with this and How'd so how did you do it what was the hook i could dying to know now you know what i i I will send it to you but i don't remember, don't remember. It, okay it was literally <laughs> it was funny. 12 years ago okay so then I had this letter with this huge track record. It was right. only one, yeah. one thing. You but only it, need one breakthrough. Yeah. And so I, I just emailed my list and I said, if you're a consultant, because it, it would only really work with consultants or coaches, if you're a consultant or a coach and you're having trouble generating leads, you ought to try my $25 million letter. I told the little story, right. had a testimonial. I ended up taking that same letter and licensing it to about 14 different companies in different industries. Mm-hmm. And I charged $15,000 plus 20% of the profits they made with okay. it. And that was across 14 companies. It took me 10 minutes at most to customize the letter for nice. each client. And I just had these licenses and it ran for as long as they use them. Most of them use them say two, three, four years. Yeah, that's And then good. they were looking. And the truth is they could have used them longer, but companies are always looking for something new always, and greater. Yeah, that's like the but, Henry Ford thing. But <laughs> I was able to multiply myself and make a lot more money than I'd make writing something from scratch. Yeah. Because when you write from scratch, so many things fail. So, right. But I knew this had uh, a track record and it worked. And, and it turned out that it did work across many different industries. Now, when you're doing 20% of profits, sometimes people aren't as honest as they should be or they get tired of paying and they say that their profits have gone down. Do you like profits versus like a lower percentage, a higher percentage of profits or a lower percentage of gross or net sales? Yeah, you know, I do both. I've tried 5% of net sales. Yeah. But it always depends. It depends on the company's profit margin too. Yeah. Because if a company is on a really tight profit margin, seven, eight, ten percent, they look at five percent of sales and say, "No, we'll go out of business." Yeah. Do that. So, so, so one, I, I use those figures in general, but I'm always going to negotiate something that's going to be a, you know, a win for them. Yeah, it's going to be a win for them, a win for me. And a, and a way that that I've gone about that that might be helpful if you're listening would be. Let's say that that you want twenty percent of profit of, of profits, then don't get into a deal that allows them to manipulate what profits are. Project what profits are because, as you said, margins vary from industry to industry. So let's say, for example, you you said I think a seven percent. Let's say that they only had a seven percent margin. Well, then I would say twenty percent of seven percent is one point four. So then agree on one point four percent of net sales. And, and for people that are listening, net sales is gross sales minus returns and allowances and chargebacks exactly. and things like that. So it's not net profit. That way, you are still, you tell your person, I'm only going to take 20% of net profits, but so you don't have to worry about what you're spending on ads and all that. Let's just look at what your actual profit margin is, yeah, exactly. and then I'll take 20% of that, and we'll just agree on that as a flat fee. Yeah. And then, you know. See, now you can explain that in a much more succinct way <laughs> than I ever could. And the other. What you said is important, too, about defining what net profits is because you don't want them throwing in uh, overhead and the the lease on the new Bentley that they're going to add right, in exactly. and, and all those things. Yeah. So, is it yeah. real profit? Or yeah. There was a book uh, 
on how Hollywood connects because we we did some movie deals for some clients uh, when I was practicing law, and there's a book I think it's called Fatal Subtraction, <laughs> and it's it's how that a movie might make a billion dollars at the profit at the at the box office, but if you're on a royalty as a writer or something, they're like, oh no, it lost money. We didn't yeah. make it. It's like, well, but wait, you know, and they throw all that stuff in there. So yeah, that's a really important point. Okay, so we, now we've got uh, I think three ways. We've got the process thing that we talked about first with the ink. We've right. got the uh, certification thing that we talked about second, and then we've got the, I guess, is it intellectual property? Is yeah, that what you would call that, it? So a couple other ways, they're joint ventures. A joint venture is always a license. It's a temporary agreement right. between companies. But we teach companies to either do this for themselves or consultants to broker this service right. companies, to set up what I call a repeating circuit joint venture. Okay. And what that means is, so let's say you sell uh, a course on how to play the guitar. You go out and find five other companies that sell things. Maybe one company sells sheet music, another sells uh, recording devices, another sells, uh, I don't know, guitar strings, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you agree to promote each other twice a year. And I like to get a total of six companies. And the, so it, it repeats. I mean, it starts with one company and then it rolls through till the six and then it starts over. So you get two promos over. a year, but basically. You get two promos a year, yeah. which means you're building your list and getting sales. Right. But you're also getting commissions from all the promotions you do for the other companies. Mm. Now, you could set it up so no one gets commissioned. Sure. You just keep 100%. But I found that most companies like that profit share. And then they get money all year round, right. so that's more, more exciting right. because if they had to wait... You know. And when you do it that way, it creates a very reliable, systematic form of cash flow. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're doing joint ventures one at a time, which are still fine and companies do, you constantly, you're looking for the next partner, the next partner, and the next. Okay. So it's just kind of an economy of scale by setting it. them up like that. That's great. That's another method. And then... An, if you're a broker on that, is there, what do you recommend people charge when they put something like that together? Well, first of all, with any consulting or coaching service, there always has to be a, re, uh, a retainer in mm -hmm. the beginning. Right. You never do it I mean, I so I generally learned this the hard way. As I generally, I. <laughs> use, yeah, I generally use that twenty percent of profits, uh -huh. and I get them to project their profits themselves, uh -huh. and then we agree on it. But there, and then from that, I want about five percent of that minimum okay, as upfront. the retainer. Yeah. So a quarter of the twenty percent right. projected profit that right. you would have, because without a retainer. Your project's always on the back burner. Yeah, it, they have to have skin in the game. That, yeah. That's the, the if it's free, it has no value. That's right. sadly, you know, no matter what it was worth, if yeah. it's if it's free, they just won't take yeah. action. Then you go out and you know you tell them exactly what you're going to do, what assistance you need from them. You work with them to create a list of the other companies that would be good for this circuit. You approach them. You make the deal with them. I always like it to be a 50-50 split because that's equitable to everybody and that's across the board. And then you basically just shepherd the project through and you collect your percentage. Now, what I do is whoever I broker the deal with, so say I brokered the deal with you and we find five other companies, I'm only going to take my 20% from you. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to dip into everybody. I see. Uh, a lot of people say, well, why don't you? You can make all this money. Six times and as much. You <laughs> could. But anytime you get greedy, mm -hmm. deals fall apart quickly. Yeah, I agree. And there's no reason to. Yeah. So uh, that's the, the simplest way to explain it. Okay. And I think we got one more, right? Okay. So the one more is that, uh, and, and this is kind of acting as a middleman for services for other companies. This is the toll gate kind of strategy? Yeah, this is a toll gate. Okay. And what it means is that regardless of what product or service you sell, and you can do this with products, but I, I always teach companies to do it with services. 
there are other services that company that customers want. The minute they start buying something, there's a, a service associated with that that they want. And this works best for service businesses. You can do it with products too, but let's just talk about services to keep it simple. Sure. So it's best illustrated with an example. I've got a client who sells SEO services. Mm -hmm. So and search engine optimization search for those engine people who are listening. Yeah. And so he's constantly being asked by his clients, well, who's good at Facebook marketing? Who's good at pay-per-click? I need a graphic designer. Do you have it? I need web development. Do you have it? No, 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 no. But if he said, I'll find it for you, or if he digs in and he looks, wait a minute, we use this company for our Facebook. We use this company I've got an independent company that does our graphic design. Like I use an independent company to build my websites. I don't have someone on staff. Mm -hmm. You can bro you can create arrangements with those companies to broker deals for them. Essentially, you're getting a finder's fee. You're referring to them. Sure. And so what happened was, so I said to my client, what's the number one thing people ask you for? Right. He said, website development. I said, great. So next time someone asks you, tell them yes. And then we're going to use your web developer. And if that web developer isn't, isn't available, we'll go out to Odesk or Upwork and we'll find people who are rated five stars and have a track record of at least a hundred great reviews so we know they're good and we'll broker a deal between them so long story short he had a guy who came in and said i need three or four pages done for my website i can't find anyone they want to do the whole website or nothing right can you do it he said sure he said what was the bid and the guy said it was like i think it was three thousand mm -hmm. dollars so he goes to his designer and said, what would you charge for this? I said, I have $600. Said, right. Good, sold. Right. Goes to the other guy and said, well, instead of $4,000, i am going to charge you two. Right. How's that? That's great. And he said, I can have the job done for you in a week. He then connects his designer with the client. He's that toll gate. He's that toll position. And in he made the 333%. He's just the connect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and then I, I said to him, well, so now what you want to do is take some of your employees who have extra time on their hands and they're going to go out and you're going to do a mailing to your list offering this web development service and they'll service the clients mm -hmm. and you'll give them a commission for each one they bring in yeah. and now you have an entire new division of your company but you don't have any overhead for it and all you're really doing is connecting people yeah and so he went out and did it. and you can do that and I recommend that companies do it with the services they're already using, yeah. right? Absolutely. And so some good friends of ours, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear, they do exactly that. They broker all kinds of deals for different services for a graphic design package. There's a traffic generation package. What else do they have? There's a content management system. Newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. They're brokering deals for the services they already use and they know and they can and, and say in 100% in confidence, this is a great vendor, and you just broker the deals. You can add multiple divisions to your company by doing that with no overhead, no training costs, no staff costs, no nothing. Yeah, it's really great. It's the other side of what we call uh, E2P, expenses to profits. So we look at in every business we've got, and when we're doing consulting, we look at every single expense that you have. We say, what are your top seven expenses? And payroll is usually a giant one, yeah. right? So yeah. it might be space, it might be content, it might be development, dev costs. And then we say, okay, well, all of those things, all of those expenses that you've got can be converted into profit centers, which is basically what you're saying there as well. Yeah. And what's cool about that, I know that when I was talking to one of the companies I advised, Tucker Max created a book company where he yeah. writes books for people. And we've done like a thousand books now through that company. Wow. And when I first talked to him about this, he, he was like, there are at least nine new entry points for, for customers to come into my funnel. Because what he did originally was he wrote books 
And that was the only service you could buy. And yeah. we said, okay, well, what are all the costs, component costs of that? There's editing, there's book design, there's the launch, there's the speakers yeah. bureau, there's all that stuff. And I'm like, well, but if instead of requiring somebody to buy all of that, you made each of those independent things available, now you've got new business that can come in because chances are somebody that's already written a book that needs editing is going to write another book and somebody that needs a book launch, you know, it's like exactly. you, so if you think about as a customer journey too, that, and I'll, I'll stick with the book thing because it's, it's somewhat linear, but so you write a book and then you need to have it edited and then you need to have the layout done and then you need a cover and then you need, you know, on and on and on. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, a, that's the customer journey. If you can only pick somebody up at the beginning of that customer journey and you can't bring other people in along the way, then you're really cutting off a tremendous amount of potential business that right. you could have. And each of those new places that you can bring somebody in is a new place to bring somebody in that can then cycle back through the full customer right. journey. So right. I think it's really bright, and, really and smart. It, and it's really important that people realize because they run their business on a day-to-day basis and they have all these relationships but those relationships you've built are leverageable assets yeah and most people don't think of them that way they just go oh i'm so glad i've got a great bookkeeper but you have a great bookkeeper and your clients don't right they're sick of theirs and so that is an asset that you can leverage and your bookkeeper is going to love you and your customer is going to love you and your customer is going to be more loyal because you helped solve this problem for them. And like you said, now you've got five, seven, ten entry points instead of start here and that's it. Exactly. What? So do you have a name for what, what you call that? I, I just call that asset licensing. Okay. So we have asset licensing. We have certifications. So if I remember them all, we had the process license we had the ip license like copywriting and things which was in the repeating circuit thing yeah right right. so those are those are kind of five so that's pretty awesome and then i think you have a whole bunch more in your programs and stuff too yeah actually in my program i teach it's kind of the 80 20 i've got 23 different ways to license assets but your mind would turn to pudding if you tried to learn a man so I extracted out the five simplest, fastest, and, and highly profitable ways to do it. I love it. And that's what I teach in the program. So if somebody wants to find out more about that program and all the different things you do, what, what's the best way for them to do that? I just completed the first round of the program yesterday. Okay. So I don't have a link for the program up, but I can do something that I hope people will appreciate more instead of just going out and reading the sales piece of watching the sales video, I do have a free ebook oh, on licensing. Um, it's called The Licensing Solution. Okay. And it covers 11 of the different ways Great. To, to license your assets. Okay. And that's free. And that's right on the homepage of my website, which, which is, is licensinglab.com. Okay. Licensinglab, singular, right. dot com. Dot com. Okay. And that homepage is an opt in to get that free ebook. Fantastic. And then as far as social or podcasts or any other ways for people to communicate with you, Um, is there any way you like that or do you want them to email you? What do you you like? You know, I I do have a Facebook page, but the the best bet to get in touch with me is to grab the copy of that ebook. That way you're on my list. You can then email me through that. I tend, I, I spend some time on social, but not as much time as Probably I should. Right. Take pictures. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) My hobbies. And, you know, the the truth is I'd rather be scouring through the latest toy journals and coming up with ideas for toys and gizmos. I have a barbecue device I'm working on, too. Nice. So gizmos and stuff. So, you know, it's like you said, I actually do what I teach and I always help kind of spend a lot of time doing that. Nice. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you coming in. Thanks a lot for having me. It was great. You asked questions that most people don't. It (laughs) really made it fun. Nice. You've been listening to Business Lunch with Roland Frazier. If you're enjoying the show, let us know by subscribing and leaving a review. And for more information, go to businesslunchpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.